Ever wonder how the body processes processed foods? When corn becomes Cheetos, or wheat becomes Twinkies, for example, or water becomes Coca-Cola, how does the body react, and what are the health consequences, and who is responsible for any negative effects? These are but some of the questions that occupy our guest, Dr. Carlos Montero. I am Kelly Brownell, Director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University and Professor of Public Policy at Duke. Carlos Montero is a Professor of Nutrition and Public Health at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where he chairs the Center for Epidemiological Studies in Health and Nutrition. His research includes methods in population nutritional and dietary assessment and the impact of food on health. He is fascinated by social trends and by the biological and socioeconomic determinants of nutritional deficiencies and obesity. Carlos has supported the Ministry of Health in Brazil in the development of the internationally acclaimed New Dietary Guidelines for the Brazilian Population and serves as an advisor to the World Health Organization on Obesity and Nutrition. 2010, he received the Pan American Health Organization's Abraham Horwitz Award for Excellence in Leadership in Inter-American Health. Carlos, thank you so much for joining us. I'm delighted you could speak with our audience all the way from Brazil. Yeah, my pleasure. So you pioneered work on what you call ultra-processed foods, uh, and I find this work fascinating and very important. Now, people may have some sense of what processed food is, but what do you mean by ultra-processed food? Actually, what um, is new in terms of food processing is that uh, its role in the food system has changed phenomenally in the, in the last 20, 30 years. So in the past, or until very recently, the role of food processing was to essentially to preserve food and to make food preparation easier. So then uh, this role was very important, it's still very important, but this role leads to the industry to produce minimally processed foods, such as pasteurized milk, for instance, or cereal grains or fermented milk. It also produces culinary ingredients like uh, plant oils, even sugar, that are used to cook these minimally processed foods, and also transform some foods into processed foods, like cheese and bread. Uh, in all these cases, what we have is, is modified foods. Ultra-processed foods are not modified foods. They really do not contain foods. They are a formulation of, of industrial ingredients, a very low-cost ingredients. And this was possible by the development of uh, food technology in the, in the last uh, years. So ultra-processed food actually uh, result from the fractioning of uh, whole foods into components and it includes the recombination of these components. So these components could be protein isolates, could be starch, could be uh, sugar, could be oils, could be fats. So then, in a way, ultra-processed foods are a recombination of these low-cost ingredients added of additives, and particularly cosmetic additives. So additives that are in these products to make them very tasty, very colorful, very attractive. So in a way, ultra-processed foods result from advances in food science and food technology, but it uh, is not an advance in terms of human health because our bodies are simply not prepared to be fed with these formulations because these formulations, they lack the food matrix. That is something we know it's very important for our, our bodies. So essentially, an ultra-processed food is a, an invention of modern food technology that allows huge profits, but that is very harmful for our bodies. Well, Carlos, you mentioned that these, uh, the, the body doesn't um, ad adapt to these foods in the normal way because it doesn't sense what it's expecting from normal foods. What are the effects on biology and, say, on the regulation of appetite? 
So we, we really don't know everything that is uh, associated with this big change in our, in our diet, but we know some, some, something we know. For instance, we know that uh, when you do these formulations combining sugar, salt, fats, with all additives that are particularly flavors, you produce uh, products that uh, are consumed that tend to be consumed in excess. So these products and the, the formulation of these products actually aim, aims to, uh, to fool our bodies in terms of uh, uh, making our bodies consume more than we need. So in a way, we lose the ability to control the amount of food we need because we are not really consuming food. We are consuming these hyperpalatable formulations. So hyperpalatability is one important uh, characteristic of these, these products because this can explain part the fact that we tend to consume too much of these foods. Uh, but there are other problems. So uh, I mentioned before that, that they are full of additives. Uh, and when we say full, we are saying really doses and doses of new additives every year in the food supply. And in some cases, like emulsifiers, for instance, that are very common in ultra-processed foods, we know that these emulsifiers, they can affect the permeability of our intestinal cells. So then we, again, we lose ability to control what goes in our bodies because these emulsifiers destroy some protection we have against the absorption of some molecules. Uh, artificial sweeteners, I mean, another common additive used in ultra-processed foods. We know today that they have uh, big effects in, in, our, uh, in our bodies. So in a way, ultra-processed food represents a problem because they contain and intrinsically imbalance macronutrients, too much sugar, too much unhealthy fats, too much sodium. But at the same time, they include things that are completely strange for our body, like the additives. So then uh, this explains why we've, we see in epidemiological studies that the more a person consumes ultra-processed foods, the higher the risk of several chronic diseases, including obesity, including cardiovascular diseases, including certain types of cancer. So really, they represent a big public health problem today. Carlos, you make a compelling case that these affect how much food people eat really in two fundamental ways. One is the foods are highly palatable, and so people like them and want to consume more and more and more. But it also sounds like the normal mechanisms that, sh that stop eating and the satiety mechanisms are also affected. And I wanted to ask you about something that you brought up in particular. You mentioned the impact of artificial sweeteners. W what is your belief about what those do? Yes. First of all, here we have to, 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 to separate two situations. So one person, for instance, has diabetes type 1. And, uh, and, and they, they should avoid sugar. So th this is one case. But uh, what, what I'm saying that artificial sweeteners are not necessary is for healthy people, for normal people. For people that don't have a specific disease, if they avoid ultra-processed foods, automatically they will avoid excessive sugar intake. In, in the U.S., for instance, we have uh, studies based on NHANES, so representative diet in the U.S., and when we divided the U.S. population in five quintiles, and we take the five quintile of the lowest consumers of ultra-processed foods, they have uh, about 7% of free sugar in their diet. So, and, and this re is repeated in other countries. So the driver of excessive sugar consumption in all the countries that we study until now are ultra-processed foods. If you remove the ultra-processed foods, we can very easily come to 6-7% of free sugar in the diet, which is maybe not ideal, could be less, but certainly it represents a much lower problem than the present situation where 
the average consumption of uh, free sugar is 13, 14% in the US. So th th that's where I'm saying artificial sweeteners are not necessary because we can avoid excessive sugar, free sugar consumption by simply reducing the consumption of ultra processed food. So we don't need artificial, we don't need reformulation. What we need is to reduce the amount of ultra processed foods we consume. Well, Carlos, when you said that these artificial sweeteners are not necessary, is the solution to just get people accustomed to less sweetness in foods? Yeah. So this is interesting because in our studies of different countries, we see that uh, um, at the beginning, when you have a country in the, in the early stage of the dietary transition, which means people consuming mostly real food, the first ultra-processed foods people consume are soft drinks, for instance. The soft drinks is something that even countries like Japan, for instance, the consumption of ultra-processed foods in Japan is very low, but not of, of soft drinks. So soft drinks is uh, the, the door to the, the world of ultra-processed foods. All other things are uh, things that people use to cook, these uh, bouillon, so things that people that are ultra-processed formulations, and then people start to use this. But after you get this first, let's say, entry points for ultra-processed foods, then you get all sorts of sweet and savory snacks. So this comes next. And after that, we have uh, all the uh, candies, all the industrialized desserts. And finally, people start to replace the whole lunch and dinner by ultra-processed food lunches and dinners like uh, frozen lasagna, like uh, chicken nuggets, like all these ultra-processed foods. So depends on the country. We, we see more common some types of ultra-processed foods like soft drinks and snacks. But in a situation like in the U.S., more than 50% of calories come from ultra-processed foods. So all companies, say an automobile company or a clothing company, um, works to maximize how desirable their products are, and the food companies obviously would do the same thing. So can we fault them for making their foods taste as good as possible, or are they going beyond this, do you think? Okay, that, it's a very good question. And I, I'm actually used to, to do this analogy with the car industry, the food industry. It, it's very clear that in the car industry, as other industry, the, the industries are always trying to reduce cost of their products and make them better. So in terms of cars, you, you change the type of material that you use. For instance, you do a lot of parts of the car with plastic and not more with metal. And with these uh, cars come lighter, they are more economic and uh, maybe more comfortable. They have a uh, long duration technology. In these cases of uh, what I would say the inorganic industries, like a car industry, they are very welcome. And uh, maybe they have some undesirable byproducts, but this is not a big problem. With food, what happens with food is that when the industry tries to reduce the cost of uh, the final product of food, they do this by destroying actually food and recombining their components. Essentially, that's, that's the secret of the profits of the ultra-processed food industry. You take some crops that are high-yield crops, and you use them in a way to extract the cheapest protein, the cheapest oil, the cheap carb, and then you recombine them into a product of very low cost, and then you use all the additives, etc., to make them tasteful and desirable. The problem with food is that the food goes into our bodies. So then we are entering in the organic world. The risk of uh, having trouble when you destroy the food and you recreate new foods from the components of the original foods is that you lose all the advances that were provided by the evolution. Because foods, in a way, they, are, they belong to the living world. They, are, they have a, a combination of nutrients and non-nutrients in a way that they make sense for the plant, in the case of, of a plant, and for us, like other living organisms that decide to consume certain types of food. The question of ultra-processed food is that they are really no longer foods in a way that they don't preserve the food matrix, 
but at the same time, they taste and they look like real food. And uh, I think that that's the origin of all the problems we have. So perhaps uh, we need to admit that uh, we need to be much, much more careful when we apply technology to the food in the food system. So it's, it's different when you are in the inorganic world and when you are simply replacing steel by plastic. Maybe you can do this in a very positive way, but the same probably does not apply to the food world when you start to provide sweetness, not, not more from sugar, but from a molecule that you synthesize and that uh, resemble the same sweet taste, but they are totally different things. What would you say are some of the most important policy implications of this work? Yeah, well, this, the, the, the implication is that uh, the ultra-processed food industry should be regulated the same way we regulate drugs, we regulate tobacco, we regulate alcohol. What's different for people to understand that, of course, in the case of tobacco, it's something totally artificial, something that uh, we shouldn't consume. And it's more or less obvious because you are putting in, into your body hundreds of substances that uh, do not belong to our body, right? But in the case of food, uh, the difficulty is that uh, real food and most foods, I would say, they are safe and they, we need them and the uh, regulations should, should, should be in terms of hygiene and some quality control. But of course, we do not see foods as something that should be regulated as drugs or tobacco or alcohol. But there's one type of food, which are these formulations of ingredients that should be regulated. So I'd say that the main implication is that if we assume that uh, there is a big divide between food processing until you make cheese and bread from a situation where you do chicken nuggets or potato chips or soft drinks that really are not food in a way. So, and because they imply a risk for consumers, they should be regulated. And, but what the ultra processed food industry uh, does to, uh, is to say, well, we, we all need food. We need to consume food. Foods should be something not regulated as other dangerous commodities. But, and I think that's the main merit, I think, of our work was exactly that. So we draw a line between foods, what we call real foods, that should be treated as, as foods, and uh, one particular group of foods, which are ultra-processed foods, that should be regulated. And uh, the way we also develop a way to recognize ultra-processed foods in a practical way. Carlos, thank you so much for being on the Leading Voices in Food. I very much appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and expertise with others. Our guest has been Dr. Carlos Montero, Professor of Nutrition and Public Health at the School of Public Health, University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And thank you to the listeners. Please subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Apple Podcasts, or by visiting the website of the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.